looking at is a failure of local rapid divergence to lead a long-term signature. And they suggest that Davies speciation then is the critical thing which happens at around this time, at around 10 to 6 to 10 to the 7 uh, years, which then enables divergence to accumulate and become greater and greater. Um, so I'm very happy to see this paper, and I'm going to be interested to see the, uh, the, uh, the interpretations of it. Um, so that is part one, and we'll see if I get through all three parts. Um, uh, and so the, so the thought there is possibly Eldridge and Gould were right about the pattern and right about the claim that speciation contributes in a very important way to the evolution of great, of large uh, phenotypic differences among lineages. Um, uh, but, uh, but possibly they were right for the wrong reason. Possibly I have a better idea. Um, Thing two had to do with genetic constraints. And remember I said that that, uh, that Bloom portrayed the evolutionary synthesis as, as saying that organisms were just spheres and that natural seduction could push them in any direction, which is to say they could be more or less become more or less equally adapted in any way to any challenge that the environment might present. And he said, and he, and he said in, in the book that he that was published just before his death, um, he said Darwinian theory, in order for it for natural selection to be the, the regarded as, as creative, um, he said Darwinian variation must be copious in amount and effectively isotropic. That is to say, equal amounts of variation with respect to all possible characteristics of the organism, which should be able to be gone in any direction. And, and this has been voiced by several people, most recently the philosopher of science, or philosopher of philosopher of biology, John Dickey, is saying much the same thing in a recent book. Okay. Uh, but now, I first I want to say that I think that this characterization of the evolutionary synthesis that uh, Gould has, has, uh, has given us here um, is really not quite accurate. Um, certainly, uh, the, the, the architects of the synthesis who were most familiar with organisms um, didn't uh, let me give you two examples. In, uh, in the 1963 book that I mentioned, Ernst Meyer writes, or wrote, and he said, a system of canalization tends to narrow down evolutionary potential and accounts for parallel evolution. He said, the direction of evolution, therefore, is not random, and yet it's not predictable either. In other words, he was saying that there were that the characteristics of organisms weren't canalized, they were channeled so that they varied in certain ways and not others, and consequently, not all possible paths of evolution were open to a species. Um, Leonard Stephan is the botanist um, uh, from the evolutionary synthesis. In a rather later book, 1974, described what he taught, what he called an adaptive modification along the lines of least resistance. And he illustrated this with saying, Suppose that you wanted to increase the number of seeds produced by a plant. If you are looking at a number of the Deliasidae, you would have to increase the number of ovules per carpel because every member of that family has exactly three carpels in the flower. And so you would increase seed number by the number of ovules. On the other hand, in the garden Deliasidae, um, every flower has exactly one, um, uh, one, uh, one ovule per carpel, but the number of carpels is variable both within species and among species. And so in that case, it is the number of carpels that we have to evolve. Okay. And then finally, in the family Asteraceae, um, each flower again has only one ovule, it can make only one seed, it has only one carpel, but the number of flowers in each flower head is variable, and so an increase in seed number would require modification of that characteristic. So in other words, not all imaginary and morphological modified modifications would be open. They would differ from one group, one lineage of plants to another. Um, so uh, on the other hand, um, I think we may have been reacting to statements to the view that he has been very popular among a lot of population geneticists. Um, and uh, this was certainly articulated.
teachers and by one of the Muir's academic grandfather, uh, Richard Lewington, um, who wrote, and this is, I think, now a famous quote, that after reviewing a great deal of literature about Drosophila, he said there appears to be no characteristic that cannot be selected, that cannot be altered in Drosophila. There is good reason to suppose that any outbreak population will contain enough variation with respect to almost any character to allow effective selection. Twenty years before, the quantitative geneticist can another and said much the same thing. He said that genes and gene combinations can arise to do anything. Um, uh, uh, John Barker uh, wrote the simplest possible evolutionary constraint, namely lack of genetic variation, would appear not to be important. And I said some, some much the same thing in the first edition of my textbook, and you can read much the same thing in an essay by Nick Larson and Linda Partridge in, uh, just 10 years ago. Um, so, um, so the question is, uh, are there genetic, are, there, are genetic constraints uh, real and important, or is that very genetic variation essentially so abundant in every respect that natural selection can essentially do anything with it? Um, and I come down very strongly, increasingly, on the side of genetic constraints um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that we certainly think that there must be some kinds of constraints that account for unique evolutionary events, of which there are many. For instance, only one kind of mammal has evolved a prehensile nose, um, namely like the trunk of an elephant. Uh, the feather is an absolutely unique invention in all of of all of evolutionary history. Um, only one lineage of bats, of Los Hieros, had evolved to be vampires, uh, feeding on blood. And that, of course, is the neotropical lineage, the Desbodontine, um, the vampire bats. Even though in Africa there are great herds of mammals full of blood just waiting for bats to attack them, but there are no blood feeding bats there. Um, Another very important feature that any ecologist should know about, and we've heard some discussion already at this conference, is phylogenetic niche conservatism. Um, many of you are familiar with the butterfly genus Elegonius, of which there are perhaps 90 species. The larvae of all Elegonius species and of the entire tribe, um, Elegonii, uh, all of them on the plants in the family Passiflorasia. All of them. No, none of them deviate from that. And that is a habit which has persisted for at least 35 million years, given the dating to the common ancestor of the Pelagonia uh, butterflies. And there are many, many other groups of insects which similarly um, show a long history of association with just one group of plants. Um, well, I was interested in the um, question of whether the history of phenotypic evolution has been shaped in part by limitations of genetic variation. Um, and so I tried to do this with the study of a group of beetles, of Fraella. Um, each is a specialist on one, one genus, or usually one genus of plants in the family Asteraceae. Um, and here's an estimate of the phylogeny of the 13 species of beetles. Um, based on the mitochondrial DNA sequence. Um, the different shadings represent which tribe, what three group, the La Familia Asteraceae, Incluye de las Plantas Ostereas, de estos escarabajos. Here you see a phylogeny of representing the host plants of those, um, of those beetles. And the arrow connects each species of beetle to its host plants. Like that. What you see is that usually closely related species of beetles are feeding on plants in the same tribe. In other words, there is phylogenetic niche conservatism with respect to host plants. And so I ask, is the, um, is the association of a species with a particular host plant, could that be because it was more likely to adapt to a plant which was closely related to the host of its ancestor or of its close relatives, was that more likely than shifting to a different tribe of plants altogether? So are some paths of evolution of host association more likely in these peoples than others because of limitations on genetic variation 
And the, so what we did was to use methods of quantitative genetics to screen four species of beetles. And we tried to measure the amount of variation in their ability to feed and their ability to survive on plants, which are the hosts of related species of beetles in the same genus. So we try each species of beetle on several different kinds of plants and measure many, many individuals to see if there is genetic variation in their capacity to eat that plant, which is not the normal host plant of that species, but which is the normal host plant of another species of beetle in the same genus. And, the, and there were in all about, uh, I, think, uh, I think it's here, 37 uh, combinations of beetle species and plant species, adults and larvae both. And in about, and simply, we simply asked, but like here, did we detect any genetic variation in the response, in feeding, the responsiveness, uh, the feeding response of these beetles to a particular kind of plant? Yes or no? Genetic variation, yes or no? And the first and really interesting, really interesting uh, discovery or revelation was that in almost half of the instances, half of the combinations, we could not detect genetic variation. We could not detect any heritability. And possibly there is some heritability and that it was too low for our sample size to detect. But these sample sizes were you know, fairly substantial. Not, nothing compared to studying yeast or bacteria, but you know, better than for anyone than for any vertebrate, um, usually. Um, so this, first of all, is a, an observation which differs from the vast majority of what has been reported in the literature of genetic variation uh, on, on many species of organisms. There appear to be many characteristics that seem not to display any genetic variation. Namely, the feeding, the behavioral acceptance of a foreign host one. We then asked whether the, the genetic variation was associated with whether the test plant is the host of a closely related beetle in the same clade of the beetle phylogeny, or a more distantly related beetle in a different clade of the phylogeny. And the answer was yes, there is some association, you can see here today, so the statistically significant. So there is a tendency for beetles to display genetic variation primarily with genetic variation in their ability to feed and to survive. Primarily, if the plant that you present to them is closely related to the host plant of a closely related beetle. And of course, that means also that the plant is closely related to the normal host of the beetle that we are, uh, that we are studying. And so the subject, the implication that I drew from this was that there do appear to be some potential paths of adaptation to a novel host plant. If, if, if one of these beetles found a shortage of its normal host plant, could it adapt to some other plant in the environment? That's what we could ask. And what I'm suggesting is that it would be more likely to adapt to some plants than to others. Some certain plants probably would be entirely impossible. Others would be more likely, especially those plants that are closely related to its normal host. So that suggests that um, the patterns of genetic variation might indeed influence the possible path of evolution, and that natural selection is not the only operative factor. And around the same time, very similarly, a thematically similar idea was published by Dr. Schluter, who was used to looking at morphology. Um, said if you have two traits and you look at the pattern of variation within a population with respect to those traits, the traits may be correlated with one another in such a way that the pattern of variation forms an, an ellipse. Okay? It shows that there's some correlation between those traits. And the major axis of this ellipse, which you call the G-max, as you might know, um, and is, is along here. And, and simple selection theory uh, tells you 